we shall now move on to the next session of the day on artificial intelligence for visual surveillance i take pleasure in uh, introducing the uh, speaker for the session dr rahul raman dr rahul raman is currently serving as assistant professor in triple it dm kanchipuram earlier he was a senior assistant professor at school of computer science and engineering vit vellore he earned his phd from nit roorkela his area of interest includes artificial intelligence computer vision visual surveillance machine learning biometrics aesthetics and natural language processing his research publications comprise international journals conferences book books books chapters records and patents in these domains he has more than 30 published research work to his credit he has also served as guest editor and reviewer in many peer reviewed international journals and conferences we welcome you sir thank you uh, thank you kirtana for the uh, nice introduction and uh, thank you very much uh, selurad sir for having me this uh, opportunity thank you sir and uh, good morning to all the participants uh, sir shall i uh, share my screen now yes 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 please okay Ah yes, it is visible. All right, thank you, sir. So, uh, artificial intelligence is uh, known to all of us. It's a, it is a very uh, buzzword nowadays, like five G network in networking, and uh, artificial intelligence for visual surveillance is the topic that we will be discussing in uh, this particular session. so uh, the session will go something like this where uh, i'll try to have it into uh, different sections first i'll introduce you about artificial intelligence and uh, what are the artificial intelligence since uh, the beginning we have uh, this uh, uh, session and uh, we are listening this term artificial intelligence so many times so we'll get to know that what is it artificial intelligence how far we have reached in artificial intelligence how far we have imagined that artificial intelligence will go uh, these are the uh, points that we will talk about uh, in artificial intelligence many of the techniques of artificial intelligence uh, including machine learning and all is already been discussed so i'll just skip those part and uh, we'll try to concentrate on uh, other sections of artificial intelligence then uh, in the second uh, session we will have a one uh, demonstration of uh, multiple uh, applications that we can have on visual surveillance i'll show you some uh, different tasks that we will perform on artificial intelligence uh, on visual surveillance with artificial intelligence so uh, let us start with uh, views of uh, famous personalities and uh, definition of uh, uh, artificial intelligence what we can uh, conclude out of that and then we will uh, go ahead so uh, if you see the famous physicists like stephen hawking and uh, famous mathematician computational uh, mathematician like alan turing have uh, some strong uh, views about artificial intelligence like they feel like the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race that's how stephen uh, hawking was uh, thinking about and he was uh, very uh, strict while saying all these points even alan turing uh, he also had uh, this point that uh, they would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits and at some point of time uh, we should have to expect the machine to take over on the other hand if you uh, see uh, famous uh, persons like uh, lon musk and uh, andrew from google brain they have relatively softer but still i can say that uh, some somehow uh, uh, they remained also critical and uh, elon musk has uh, this point that uh, ai does not have to be able to destroy humanity because it it is having its own way of uh, developing itself and if human are going to come in between them, won't hesitate to uh, to go uh, past that and uh, andrew on the other hand has uh, uh, the worry that it will take away so many job and uh, that is the the worry that it was having but if you see on the other hand uh, people like amit ray john hagel and seven howard they have uh, some very positive uh, views like uh, seven howard has uh, said that robots are not going to replace humans rather they are 
going to uh, make the jobs much more humane. So all these difficult, dem uh, demeaning, demanding, dangerous, and dull jobs are the one that we are going to give them to do in, in future. So lots of these and uh, will be uh, coming to his statement again and again uh, as uh, the session will progress. John Hagel has uh, said, uh, and uh, Amit Roy, they all have this uh, similar uh, uh, views and they are also thinking that uh, it will make our human life much more uh, relaxed. So coming uh, onto the definition uh, of artificial intelligence, what we can bring in out of uh, all these is the artificial intelligence is the technology that behaves intelligently using skills associated with human intelligence, including the ability to uh, perceive, they are very important point, to perceive, to learn, to reason, and to act autonomously. So all the, all the people who are, uh, who are pointing out uh, the issues which can have with art, artificial intelligence is what if it starts acting something weird. So this act will again be, uh, be uh, based on their, their ability to reason. And that reasoning will come with the learning and the learning will come from the way they perceive. So all the control point, if you see uh, where it lies in the, uh, in the development of artificial intelligence is how they perceive. So uh, going by the very uh, definition of artificial intelligence by John McCarthy, who coined the term artificial intelligence, back in 1955, he says that uh, making a machine behave in a way that would be called intelligent is if a human uh, was performing so. So it is uh, very much about intelligence, right? So the takeaway definition that we will uh, go ahead with is to bringing in intelligence, but artificially. This is what artificial intelligence is all about. So uh, over the time, we will see that how we are bringing in this intelligence artificially, and uh, this is what we are calling it as an artificial intelligence. So what are the purposes of uh, artificial intelligence? You will see uh, the technical perspective is the, uh, of artificial intelligence is to add human capabilities and help us make advanced decisions with far-reaching consequences. And it has, of course, a philosophical perspective that uh, our life, uh, human life will become more much more meaningful, much more relaxed, and all those Ds will be uh, removed as uh, you go by the uh, definition of seven Howards. So our life will be much more connected and much more meaningful. So uh, where exactly uh, artificial intelligence has started uh, working in what all domains? So if you'll see that it is uh, omnipresent now, uh, be it healthcare, uh, automobile, uh, education, space exploration, uh, gaming, robotics, agriculture, e-commerce, uh, entertainment, social media, and of course, in the field of surveillance as well. So uh, uh, application of artificial intelligence can be found everywhere. Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, very much used in medicine, and we are uh, hoping that it will, it will increase even significantly. So virtual nursing assistance, uh, medical image analysis, medical image analysis is very much in the practice, especially in the COVID situation when uh, the, the work has accelerated a lot on use of uh, AI for uh, medical image analysis. AI assisted uh, medical analysis, drug discovery, uh, medical uh, risk prediction, AI assisted uh, robotic surgery is uh, where the uh, science is moving ahead with where uh, lots of robotics as well as AI is on board. So of course it is not very much into the practice, but soon we can see it to be happening. Artificial intelligence in the space. NASA's uh, Earth Science Data System is one of the example uh, conducting uh, system monitoring, processing uh, satellite images from the uh, this uh, private company. So many private companies are jumping into this. Uh, uh, collecting satellite images like this uh, particular that I have mentioned, this Maxar technology is adding at least uh, 80 to 100 GB of uh, data, satellite image data uh, every day and is having a, such a huge uh, data which it is trying to feed to get uh, different information out of, out of it. Uh, personal uh, assistance in space, if you see space agencies and the people uh, are having so many uh, robots which will help them, uh, which are enabled in artificial intelligence. 
uh, event horizon tele telescope is one such uh, example recently you would have seen that news where uh, artificial intelligence is used uh, with the uh, event hor horizon telescope this uh, assumes the size of the uh, of the telescope some uh, somewhere around the around uh, around the uh, shape of uh, earth which is practically not possible unless we do not apply artificial intelligence or technology like that so the black hole image which was created out of so many uh, interpolation and extrapolation was a result of uh, that ai technology itself uh, at this uh, point of time i will uh, also uh, try to show you this uh, ai in space by uh, european space agency i I'm sharing it in this mode, so it might not be audible to you, but uh, you can just uh, see to it. And uh, you can uh, appreciate how much artificial intelligence has come up in space. And uh, this is this is the uh, website of uh, European Space Agency, and you can uh, see that uh, the artificial intelligence along with robotics, uh, how much it has reached into the into the space as well. You can see this uh, machines being uh, taking uh, so many informations. Uh, this uh, this is again uh, an implementation of computer vision. If the surface is not uh, so smooth, then they can uh, they can switch their uh, uh, moving mechanism. This is uh, about uh, landing on the Mars. So all these things, uh, the basic idea is that this is uh, more than two minutes video. So uh, see, this is this object uh, being controlled uh, by by robot. So the idea is the idea is that uh, how much artificial intelligence has developed in the domains of uh, medical science, space. Uh, AI in robotics. I want you to visit this uh, Boston Dynamics website as well, where you can see uh, different uh, different robots. I think it's available somewhere. Yeah. So uh, uh, this video playing will take some time, but uh, yes, uh, you can see it later. That how Boston Dynamics are uh, developing different type of robots, which are again capable of uh, doing multiple things. So AI is uh, in robotics is not only with manufacturing and production and assembly and packaging, but it is beyond that. Artificial intelligence is uh, coming up in education where we have uh, automated uh, grading system. Uh, we have adapted uh, educational software which will uh, which will design the course uh, and uh, it will take the level of every uh, chapters according to the need of uh, one particular student and its ability to learn. Assignment analysis. Assignment analysis is uh, another uh, area of uh, research in artificial intelligence uh, used in the field of education. Where, uh, if the syllabus is not very much, uh, very much uh, good, or something is lagging in that uh, in that uh, syllabus, that can also be observed based on the performance of all the students. Uh, in a class on a particular topic. So if some all of the students are not doing good, then there must be something wrong with that. And of course, uh, Coursera is one such example which, which has already started working on that. Uh, AI tutors, AI-driven feedback, so many uh, things are happening uh, in AI by artificial intelligence in the domain of education as well. Artificial intelligence is coming a long way in natural language processing and uh, natural language understanding language uh, generation are some of the uh, some of the divisions sentiment analysis uh, these chatbots which are developed uh, they are also in one of the other form of uh, natural language processing but uh, i rather feel that uh, calling uh, natural language processing as a domain or as a subdomain of artificial intelligence uh, might not always be right because uh, these uh, terms have so much of the overlap Natural language processing has uh, developed or emerged from the linguistics, where there were there used to be rule-based uh, methods, which were which were helping us to classify or to identify uh, the problems in the field of uh, language. But over the time, that rule-based uh, method, that engine, has been shifted towards machine learning, and machine learning has started governing natural language processing, and that's how uh, now we are 
calling this uh, natural language processing as uh, as a subdomain of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is very much present in visual surveillance, and uh, visual surveillance is uh, one such doma domain where uh, you will see uh, artificial intelligence is being used very uh, slowly and very uh, critically uh, because uh, because of the uh, human uh, uh, inference or uh, that human. Uh, extra sensitivity which might be needed and the dynamic, uh, dynamic nature which is needed. So uh, pedestrian surveillance is one, one major part where artificial intelligence uh, is used in visual surveillance. Automatic uh, traffic signals uh, with uh, surveillance, event detection, uh, event detection which includes suspicious and non-suspicious classification and all and uh, identification. So uh, detection and identification is different. I will definitely talk about. Uh, one uh, again, a link that I want you to see is about Hanson Robotics, uh, which has uh, developed that uh, famous robot, uh, human-like robot, which is uh, was, uh, called Sophia, which has got uh, some uh, country's nationality as well. So this, uh, uh, this uh, robot and all, if you see what they are capable of, they have this uh, eye gauge and tilt estimation methods. They can they can uh, have eye contact with with the person to whom they are talking to. They they can have a facial expression reading expression. They can understand someone's face because the technology of face recognition. So everything is is about computer vision. They have uh, they can speak. They can they can uh, understand the words that have been taken and what is the sentiment of that. So it is somewhat uh, related to uh, language processing. So this is uh, this is nothing but uh, the implementation of uh, artificial intelligence. Now uh, this brings us to a point where we will be discussing about the differences between the artificial intelligence and and the way our human intelligence works. Of course, uh, there are few points where uh, there are many points where uh, artificial intelligence excels. Uh, first of that is reduction in human error. Of course, uh, a reduction in human error as well as reduction in human effort. If you see, want to see it from the other per perspective, it is the same uh, point uh, as mentioned earlier. It, it will impact in lots of uh, job cuts. So, uh, but yes, uh, of course, uh, there is a reduction in human error. It's availability 2407. I think many of you would have noticed that these uh, during this uh, tough time of COVID when. Uh, so many people were not working, so these chatbots have taken over. And uh, uh, particularly, whenever uh, I was uh, traveling, so I was uh, getting my uh, tickets through this uh, these chatbots. Whenever I was complaining that I have not got it on time, so it helps in repetitive work, all uh, the demeaning and all these days, if you can recall. Digital assistance, it has faster decisions. It has a rational decision making ability. This is very important. Medical application. It uh, improves security and it has efficient communication. So these are, of course, the point where AI excels. But uh, there are a few uh, points, of course, the pointers which are looking less uh, where AI lacks, but they are very important point, like high establishment cost. So uh, doing this research for uh, before establishing it itself takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and that too, the, uh, there is a chance of failure as well. So the establishment cost is high. Uh, no ethics and emotions involved, of course, and uh, which might be needed beyond the rules at times in, in the in working places. So uh, it also lacks out of box thinking. So if, uh, if it's stuck somewhere, then it might not come up with, with some uh, human intelligence to solve that problem. Maybe it cannot, it might not know that how uh, one can uh, one can explore the, those dimensions. So uh, potential, it has a potential of misuse. You can you can never expect that uh, you know in 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 any electro, uh, electric uh, corporation, some thousand of the people are are made to understand to do something illegal uh, and uh, to cut power supply from somewhere. But yes, if the system uh, is in artificial in the control of artificial intelligence, it may get hacked. It may be uh, uh, be. Uh, treated some, somewhere else and uh, we can uh, do some misuse of that. So this uh, again is, a, is uh, one of the threats that we have and it is still in the developing phase and we will see how much 
uh, it has developed. So uh, this is exactly the third point uh, where, uh, where we will talk about the types of artificial intelligence, or uh, we can say generations of uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, the first one, which where we exactly uh, lie at this point of time, is artificial uh, narrow intelligence. Why we are calling it as artificial narrow intelligence? Because uh, uh, it is bringing in that uh, artificial intelligence, but it is in a very, uh, very narrow uh, domain. Like, uh, like if you see Siri, Alexa, Cortana, uh, this uh, Google Assistant, and all these type of uh, uh, software which is helping us to know something, they are working in a very, very limited do domain. So if you want to shift your uh, question a little bit, right? If, there are the machines which will give you answer for your questions, but if you'll just shift your question a little bit, they won't be able to answer it. Similarly, if uh, uh, you know, uh, I was talking about that uh, the robots that uh, that are there in that Boston Dynamics, they are able to do many a task which are uh, related with the muscular ability of human. But uh, if you see, if you want to incorporate something else, uh, some emotion related thing, they might not be able to. Similarly, if you see that Sophia and all, so it might not be able to do some other uh, type of task. So these are very much limited into the domain. And what is uh, getting practically used at this time, which is available at, not at the research level, but at the practical level is very, very restricted in the domain. And this uh, this interconnectivity among different abilities is something which is missing. So when we will be able to develop that, and we'll be able to complete uh, you know uh, something which can mimic a human, we will reach to the that second uh, level where we have a, a machine intelligence, and uh, this refers to a computer that can uh, that can act as smart as a human and which is far from where we are right now. And then uh, uh, of course comes this artificial super intelligence, of course, with uh, all those science fiction movies and all what you are seeing right now is uh, machine uh, consciousness, but it is far from where we have right now. So people have predicted that once we reach at the level of machine intelligence, it will hardly take a time to get into stage three, which is machine consciousness. Uh, so uh, what are the components of uh, artificial intelligence? If we see uh, machine learning, which has been uh, dealt in previous session in detail, where people uh, talk, uh, have talked about supervised and supervised reinforcement, semi-supervised type of learning. It is a part of uh, bringing in intelligence artificially. So it is an artificial intelligence. Of course, natural language processing is uh, is. Uh, one such thing, computer vision. Computer vision, we'll be talking about computer vision again. And then comes uh, deep learning or new and neural networks. So what this uh, neural network is, uh, neural network or uh, we can say artificial neural network, it's, it's something like uh, uh, when we make, uh, when we make uh, uh, a system to learn the way our human brain will uh, will uh, like to learn. We'll talk about the concept of neurons. So uh, I'll just switch to uh, some writing over here. I'll just uh, switch to some writing. I'll close this video. Uh, so I think now it is visible to you. So uh, let me talk something about this neural network. Neural uh, network. Uh, neural network is uh, the way uh, the way. Uh, Artificial neural network is about the way a system will learn uh, and it will try to mimic the way our human uh, brain learns. What, what happens when we, when we start learning? Uh, when we have something called neurons. So neurons uh, have this uh, nature that uh, it evolves, it learns from its mistake. And then it uh, rectifies that and it continues learning until it perfects and uh, it believes that whatever it has learned is perfect. 
but we do not go into the detail we do not go into the into the fact that how uh, things are uh, has to be classified or what has to be done so uh, let me quote uh, some uh, concept of machine learning over here what happens uh, in case of machine learning one of the important point in machine learning is feature is feature so we try to understand the system that okay if i am having a few things like this, suppose i am having a pen or uh, i am having something which is uh, like this and i am having some uh, something else which is uh, of a certain other type then we try to classify that what are the properties of available over here and what are the properties available over here so what differentiates between them is what we identify as feature so this uh, feature identification is uh, is a task which is done by human at, uh, when we are performing machine learning when we are performing machine learning so this is this has this has been done by by the machines uh, this has been done by human but on the other hand when we do it uh, when we do it for uh, with the help of deep learning what happens is that if the uh, if this is a class and this is another class then we feed both of them as let us say uh, as some values or something and to uh, to uh, to the same engine it tries to understand that okay these are this could be the probable feature and then uh, it tests whether its output is correct or not if its output comes out to be correct it is well and good if it does not comes out to be correct uh, correct then it tries to rectify its learning procedure again and again and it ends up uh, with this process unless it perfects its classification and finally it learns in a better way it's like it's like uh, when you, when you uh, say uh, when you want to teach someone as to how to how to uh, Uh, start cycling you don't you don't tell them about uh, you know that the, this is the paddle and you have to rotate it clockwise or uh, uh, this is the handle it has to be moved like that you just uh, make a person sit onto the cycle and say that whatever happens you have to uh, you have to put your legs here you have to have your handles uh, on your hand and you have to look very much straight so once uh, the person may might fall and then it you know, and they might recognize what was the error that was done and it tries to uh, rectify that and over and over on a set of uh, uh, after a set of attempts it will learn and it will perfect the art of cycling so same thing happens uh, with with the neurons neuro and neural network so uh, uh, like uh, we'll talk about a single uh, neuron first what do we mean by a single uh, neuron it's the uh, basic unit of uh, computation in a neural network and uh, which, uh, we which we also call as a node or a unit sometime so it receives input from uh, other nodes of course uh, as we are uh, trying to demonstrate over here and we put certain uh, we uh, associate some weights uh, against those input uh, which it has to rectify over the time if it is uh, talking about uh, uh, getting a feedback so this is what it rectifies over a time and uh, this weight will be assigned on the basis of relative importance to uh, to other inputs the node uh, this uh, node applies a function f and that also we will define so let me uh, draw a neuron first so let us say that uh, this is a neuron and uh, then we will have uh, some input let's say it is x1 then some other input let's say it is x2 and uh, we will feed both of them over here then we will also take a bias i'll tell you later about this uh, bias that how it helps uh, in developing the structure and uh, then we'll be having some uh, output coming out of that and of course these are the input inputs 
So I talked about the weight. So let us assign some weight W1 and some weight W2 and this weight I'm calling it as a bias. So uh, the output, and of course we are using one function over here. The output is as a function, this function where uh, we can say it as a one into B plus W1 into X1 plus W2 into X2. So what we are, uh, how we are getting our output as, we are subjecting it to certain function. We are calling this function as, uh, as our activation function. Activation function. And this activation function will take input from a bias. Then the weights that we assign multiplied by the, uh, the values which are passed by the by the previous network or maybe from the input as received from the from the event. So uh, W1 is the weight given to this X1, W2 to this X2, and then we have some biasness. So all these values will be put under some activation function, and this is how we will get output. So this is what happens. So uh, every uh, activation function takes a single uh, number and perform a certain fixed mathematical operation onto it. So there could be uh, several activation functions as well, like uh, like uh, this uh, uh, sigmoid function. We have this uh, tan function. We have this uh, rectified linear unit called ReLU functions. So these are some of the functions that we use. Uh, I'll try to draw these functions. I don't know how can I So a sigmoid uh, function uh, somehow So uh, this is how uh, it will look like somewhere between zero to one. So it takes a real value input and uh, it will square it to the range of this uh, zero to one. Then we have this uh, tan edge function. What it will do is this time it will take it between uh, plus one to minus one, take it to plus one to minus one, it will look something like so plus one and minus one. Yeah. So uh, takes a real uh, value input and it will square it in the range of uh, uh, minus one to one, uh, plus one. This ReLU function, what we are talking about, it, uh, it reduces the negative values. It replaces all the negative values that are available. And what it does is it, uh, it, it has to be a straight line. So uh, it uh, converts it into zero. So all negatives, all negatives will be converted to, max, uh, to zero and uh, all positives will uh, remain as it is. So if I represent it as a function, it will be zero or uh, x, max of zero or x. So if the number is negative, it will be zero. Otherwise, it will be that value itself. So this is what uh, these functions will do. And uh, the function applied over these will modify the output and this way it will be fed to another another uh, layer so it means we are talking about uh, another uh, multiple such layers 
So uh, let us uh, talk about one multiple layers into uh, this feed forward neural network. Feed forward. Feed forward we are talking about because uh, the output will be uh, feed it to the next layer. Feed forward network. So uh, what will happen over here is that uh, there will be uh, multiple uh, multiple layers. Essentially, there will be an input layer, input layer, which will uh, take the input output layer, which will be having the number of neurons, same as the number of classes we expect in our output, and there will be one uh, or multiple hidden layers. So it can have hidden layer in between. So it works. So let us say that uh, we have three and then we have few nodes in the hidden layer, we are using only one hidden layer at this moment. And then we have few output layer. So what will happen? It will pass this these results. Similarly, it will pass these results. The uh, this layer is called hidden layer. Why? Because it is uh, not at all visible to the outer world. Uh, we will be having more discussion of uh, hidden layer when we will be talking about uh, hidden Markov model based implementation when we are taking up uh, one task in visual surveillance. So at that time as well, we'll be talking about this uh, hidden layer. So uh, this, what this uh, feed uh, forward uh, neural network is doing that uh, it contains uh, multiple neurons which are arranged in these different layers as you can see node from these adjacent layers have connections and edges between them okay and all these connections have weights associated have these uh, weights associated so we'll be uh, just to save time i'm not going uh, writing all these uh, weights again and again so we'll be having these uh, weights and we will be uh, whatever uh, weights that are generated uh, whatever uh, sorry whatever weights uh, which are generated they will uh, they will perform some output and they will feed it over here and then it will again go to this and similarly it will go to that now these uh, these uh, values these functions what are generated as we have just discussed, these functions will make sure that it will get generated and it will get forwarded and it will come out as a probability, right? So it will, uh, suppose uh, these are the input which went uh, as uh, which went uh, as the raw information and it got trained somehow and uh, then it is going here as a different, different probabilities and these probabilities will, uh, will have something like uh, you know, uh, let us say that uh, we are uh, i'll take one example uh, suppose uh, there are phd admissions happening somewhere and uh, the criteria which is set by the institute is uh, is uh, the marks which are uh, obtained previously by the student and it is conducting one uh, one exam okay so uh, some information will be taken from marks and some uh, information is taken from the from the exam and we have certain data like if someone has scored uh, 60 uh, in the uh, average of the marks is 60 and in the exam somebody has scored 45 then it has got uh, selected if someone has got uh, 75 and has got 30 here then he has not been selected and so on so this way what you can see is then if we want to go this uh, go with this problem and want to uh, keep it in the form of a neural network then we will be having two input 
neurons at this layer one is talking about marks another one is talking about exam then there will be having uh, more than one uh, more than two uh, neurons uh, maybe uh, one is uh, for the for the bias maybe uh, one which is uh, which will tell uh, some uh, information so we'll name it as p1 we'll be having p2 and then at the end as well we are going to have two class one is whether someone is selected or someone is not selected so uh, as we have uh, discussed here it will be subjected and uh, it will be given some weight initially so let us say that uh, some weight has been given okay so we'll uh, name it as uh, look at one of this and uh, we will give some weight w1 w2 and uh, the final output should be whether it is selected or not selected right and again you have uh, learned about uh, supervised learning so it is uh, in the supervised mode now so what is happening over here is that after this the uh, output was expected to be selected and not selected but the probability came out to be uh, somewhere around 0.6 and 0.4 now it means there is something wrong and we need to we need to rectify that so what uh, what is uh, done at that time we we feed this information forward and we go for some uh, some level of uh, optimization we, what we do we try to uh, calculate the total error at the output node and then we try to propagate these error back through the network using uh, some uh, back propagation uh, method to calculate this uh, the gradient which can be uh, optim uh, which can be uh, used for optimization like uh, like gradient descent which what it will do uh, gradient descent like uh, you know it will find the gradient and it will try to descend on that so it will uh, end up finding uh, a local minima a local minima which will help us to reduce the error function to reduce the error function so this information when it goes uh, it back propagates maybe uh, we will rectify the weight that we have got and maybe uh, we will end up with w1 dash and w2 dash and this way when we will start propagating in the forward direction once again we will find that the output has come out as 0.8 and 0.2 so we are uh, nearing to this calculation and this way we will feed forward unless we get the Uh, best classification result possible and this way the classification happens so uh, we will have uh, more of this uh, discussion when we are talking about uh, hidden markov model uh, in in one of the implementation when we are talking about so uh, we'll continue with uh, uh, computer vision from here onwards so yes uh, i was uh, talking about the co uh, components of artificial intelligence I was talking about components of artificial intelligence and there we talked about this uh, uh, language processing machine learning and of course uh, this neural network how it works and then uh, we'll talk about this computer vision what exactly this computer vision does uh, is that it is a modified form of uh, image processing and that is how it overlaps uh, with artificial intelligence so how intelligence is brought in into this image processing this is what we will uh, try to understand over here so for an example uh, let me define uh, let me differentiate between image processing and computer vision so i have an image and i have taken an image which is uh, which is slightly blur maybe because the subject was moving it's called motion blur or my camera is not uh, perfectly focused so uh, it is out of focus blur so that could be the that could be the uh, region i went uh, onto that image and i applied some uh, deep blurring technique i think a lot of uh, things about image based uh, image processing based machine learning was just uh, discussed by maslamani sir in the previous session itself so we we can go for a 
for a deep learning technique and then we can go for uh, we can go for uh, image uh, enhancement maybe by uh, contrast in, uh, enhancement or uplifting the overall uh, histogram equalization or maybe finding uh, the edges into the image so all these things where my input is an image and my output is a rectified version of an image or the correction or the way we wanted to correct it if that is the output then it is called image processing so input is an image output is also an image the way we want it but if we start inferring something out of the in, uh, out of the uh, image like if i see if i see that uh, there is there is a, a rectangular uh, thing which is placed and uh, it is uh, it looks something separate so i want to put a a uh, rectangular box over it then i i saw a human and i put a rectangular box over it okay and then i saw a vehicle over there and i want to put a rectangular box over it over and over uh, i'm seeing so many images but i see that there is a particular pattern that the uh, that the rectangle is very vertical in the nature when a human is standing and uh, when a person uh, when a car is there then this rectangle is a rectangle is very much uh, horizontal and i inferred that if i see this kind of a rectangle i can classify it as human and this as vehicle so maybe if i can infer with this type of classification so what was that the input is an image but output is some some information some uh, some inference that we are coming up with that is that is called computer vision this is the difference between an image processing and computer vision in image processing input is an image output is a modified version of image in computer vision input is an image but output is is some information or some inferences that we are making out of that image and the same thing applies on videos as well videos are nothing but uh, uh, multiple frames uh, work uh, coming one after another we'll talk about spatial and uh, temporal features at that time we will talk the difference between image and computer vision so this is uh, image processing which has become computer vision and hence the artificial intelligence concept is uh, has been brought in into the image processing so how much artificial intelligence is there in uh, video processing and uh, using the term video processing visual surveillance is just a subdomain of uh, video processing yeah so uh, artificial intelligence in video processing includes assisted living system where we have uh, child and elderly citizens which are uh, monitored their fall prediction their uh, uh, motion prediction someone's presence is predicted so many things are done in assisted living system then we have a uh, business intelligence cameras are uh, installed in malls to see eye gauge and tilt estimation of a person same uh, similar concept what we were talking about in uh, robots as well in that sofia robot which has uh, eye, uh, you know, uh, matching techniques so people uh, used to see that where the person has moved or uh, which particular shop which particular ad has attracted a person to move uh, his face towards that for a longer time to get some uh, get some inference about what should be the type of ad automated driving of course automated driving uh, driving assistance system and uh, automated parking so many things they are already uh, into the level of products nowadays visual is used in in a big way when we talk about artificial intelligence in the domain of uh, visual surveillance so uh, let me formally define this uh, term visual visual surveillance what this visual surveillance is all about this is actually a french word which means watching over surveillance from above and below means to watch so when the observation is made from a distance by means of a visual electronic e equipment or uh, like cctv cameras and all it is called visual surveillance and one of the broad uh, domain of visual surveillance is pedestrian surveillance so again i am using this term pedestrian uh, and i want it to be uh, differentiated by the term human so detecting a human in an image or in a video is uh, is often confused by detecting a pedestrian so uh, a complete definition uh, of a pedestrian is 
a human which has which has uh, which has locomotion locomotion means it is shifting in the location not motion i am sitting here and i am uh, having these gestures so it is a motion my image or my video can detect motion but my centroid is not getting displaced so that i don't have any locomotion so i may be detected as a human but i'm not a pedestrian at this point of time uh, pedestrian means it its center of mass will be having certain locomotion along with the uh, all the features which are needed in a human so uh, i'll i'll tell you that how uh, having a pedestrian does, uh, is is uh, is the is the proof that that uh, detected of uh, subject is also a is also a human but uh, just identifying human may not uh, end up with pedestrian and that may cause some error a uh, few researchers have uh, proposed that uh, human uh, detected human and uh, it turns out that they are not pedestrian so pedestrian are the most susceptible one when it comes to road accidents there are so many accidents though there are so many things so many uh, theft and everything is happening against pedestrian even these automated cars are also focused on these uh, detecting these pedestrians whether they are approaching towards us or whether they are uh, moving in some other direction so uh, most of the uh, visual surveillance research is concentrated on pedestrian surveillance so uh, but yes of course pedestrian surveillance uh, uh, apart from pedestrian surveillance also this visual surveillance domain and a few pictures here depicting uh, just video uh, processing like the the couple of uh, them which is about game and uh, tracking a ball or uh, tracking a ball in for uh, like uh, before the wicket decision in cricket these are some of the actual implementation that we see nowadays uh, of a visual uh, of video processing artificial intelligence in video processing other than that that uh, terrestrial images uh, these uh, surveillance uh, occlusion uh, detection a couple of image in binary image you can see then uh, this uh, uh, child uh, 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 tracking uh, system that whether the uh, uh, whether the child is getting asleep or someone is uh, is barging in into that room uh, tracking system everything is about uh, visual uh, surveillance uh, so we'll try to identify a few uh, different uh, different work that can be done under visual surveillance and then uh, we will take three different uh, tasks uh, of uh, visual surveillance and we will see how uh, artificial intelligence has been brought in to these so uh, uh, the tasks uh, which are uh, the tasks are like activity understanding we have already talked about activity understanding that few uh, activities uh, are characterized as uh, as fine uh, that they are not objectionable objectionable few are okay few are categorized as uh, as some crime and hence uh, alarming system may be uh, done which can classify them the activities among uh, among different category and of course it is happening in spatial domain as well as temporal domain so spatial domain uh, uh, is uh, like if some uh, property we are trying to find out within an image is within the x y coordinate of that image within that pixel itself then it is called a spatial domain that space of that image but if we are trying to find some relation from frame 1 to frame 2 to frame 3 to frame 4 suppose we are working with a video which is uh, working at 25 frames per second and uh, so it means 25 of the images are coming one after another and if we are trying to uh, identify a relation among these videos as uh, these frames uh, one after another then this uh, this domain this dimension is called temporal domain so features uh, are found out in uh, spatial domain as well as in the temporal domain you get a lot of information when you are working in uh, temporal domain but the uh, the limitation is that a temporal domain uh, needs uh, at least uh, acquisition of one second of video then only you will get 25 to 30 frames to work upon so it will be having some delay whereas if you see a spatial domain they are uh, there will be a lot of information because every uh, frame by frame you are getting new set of data and it will be more uh, detailed then another task is person re-identification 
This is also a major task in visual surveillance because our surveillance cameras are installed. Uh, it's not practically possible to install them everywhere and there will be some blind spot even in the places of hot security zones as well. And then identifying the same person over uh, in one uh, place to another place is a challenging task, which is done in person re-identification. So this task is all about that. Then uh, UAV na uh, navigation, automatic uh, signaling. Uh, when uh, when a drone is uh, is flying in a in a closed environment, then how it, it should navigate from one place to another place. That that is also also very important and. Uh, here I will uh, I will pause a bit to uh, clarify you the difference between monocular vision and binary vision. So uh, when when we go for surveillance, when we go for surveillance, uh, we what we exactly need or where we uh, generally operate is in the monocular vision. See, uh, it's quite inspired from the nature itself. If you see the animals which are there in prey class, uh, all that's in, those deer and uh, all those uh, uh, animals, buffaloes and all these, if you see, their eyes are located on both the side, right? Both the side, and they are independent of each other. So what, what happens? They will get a larger field of view. They will be getting a larger field of view, right? So what I'm trying to say is that If uh, my camera is here, this is called field of view. Field of view. So if for an animal, eyes are like this and this, it will be having larger field of view. Right, so they might be covering some 200 to 70 degrees, and with a small uh, shift of tilt of their face, they can see the entire 360 degree. They want themselves uh, under surveillance, so uh, nature has provided them to uh, with eyes which can protect them from all around uh, by giving them a larger field of view. Whereas uh, if you see the pre predator class of animals, predator class of animals. Uh, they will be having their eyes both in front, right? So they will be having their eyes both in front. So if you take uh, these uh, cat class, uh, dog class animals, if you see that uh, in, among the birds also, vultures, owls, everything, they, their eyes are placed here. So what is that? This is, you might have heard about kinetic cameras. They are also having uh, this property itself. So, this vision is called binocular vision. Binocular. Ocular. And this is called monocular vision. So individual monocular vision. So binocular vision, if this is the, uh, is the subject, what we want to have an image of, then this will take an image. This will take an image, and we know the difference between this, uh, this, and this camera previously. And then we can generate one image where we can analyze this line. This is called this is called depth of an image. So with single single view, it is very difficult uh, to know the depth of the subject. So that how far that subject is from us. But yes, if we if we uh, have two different visions we can we can definitely understand because our camera is uh, two of the cameras are capturing it from two different views and then uh, somewhere uh, in the behind we are processing it to know the depth that is this uh, this uh, third line this is called the depth so this depth information is very much uh, needed when we are navigating so if you see the second diagram where we are talking about uh, navigation of drone or when we are talking about uh, automated cars are uh, they want to see whether someone is approaching towards them or not so at that time we need depth information when we are performing the surveillance we we want maximum field of view to be covered so uh, this is again a very uh, challenging task 
that uh, if uh, because uh, most of the installations are there the single camera view so in single camera view how can we bring in the depth information that is again a very challenging task so there are uh, so many uh, work which has been done i'll try to uh, give you a bit of uh, uh, information on that as well so this is the difference between monocular vision and binocular vision depth information uh, as well uh, another another very important thing is video summarization because so many videos getting captured so it is also very important to not to uh, to have all the videos and rather to have a summarized video i'll give you two different types of video summarization examples like uh, if i am using a baby assistance uh, camera so it is not uh, it is not uh, it is although it is capturing it 247 it will not create updates for me for all 247 time it will only create on certain occasions where uh, some person is detected to be uh, uh, to be barging in into that area or uh, that baby is found to be uh, seated and it's not uh, no more slipping uh, or it also includes uh, some of the acoustic based uh, detection if uh, there is if the baby is crying so it will take that entire video and cut out the important uh, sections of the video rather than going with that so this is uh, taking that entire video and finding out small chunks of video this is one way of uh, pro providing video, uh, summarization the other could be that within one image itself like uh, this uh, you can see over here that uh, the frame is constant and all regions of, uh, of the frame is not active. So if they are not active, we will classify it as background. Suppose there is, there is a still, uh, still camera which is capturing and there is only one person which is moving in front of it. So the whole uh, thing is called as background and only that person will be identified as, as the foreground. So what we will do, instead of uh, capturing multiple backgrounds and multiple foregrounds, we will our background remains constant. So we will have one background with multiple foregrounds to just uh, depict it. I, I think the image uh, tells it very perfectly that how video summarization over a frame is done. Then we have a lot of work in visual forensics and uh, uh, authentic uh, signature identification, uh, uh, lip print, thumb print, uh, eyes, uh, iris, periocular, so many things are identified in, in case of visual forensic as well. And then we have this uh, multiple uh, multi-camera network system. So working on multi-camera network, the work has to be uh, divided very intelligently that what are, uh, what are the processing which is going to be centralized and what are the processing which is going to be distributed. Here uh, we also uh, used to have those uh, uh, those complex cameras which are which can work dynamically like uh, ptz cameras patented zoom cameras so what they do is that if the person is moving in certain direction then it will try to try to have a mechanism on the distributed level where it can start tracking that person as as and when it is moving and based on its recommendation if the person has moved towards the left side then it can alert that camera which is located on left of it that now you be aware that someone is coming into that uh, in that area so half of the work is uh, taken care of centrally because it needs information from all the camera half of the work is done at the distributed level because it has to be taken decision at the central level so these are some of the type uh, some of the work uh, what we have uh, done after this is that this visual surveillance domain uh, we have tried to identify uh, four different subdomains into it, and we have brought in uh, tasks uh, which implements, uh, which uses artificial intelligence and bring it uh, into the domain of visual surveillance. So the domains or the steps uh, are identified like this. The first one is camera placement and acquisition. Of course, uh, in the domain of visual surveillance, what is very important is camera placement and acquisition i think uh, previously it, uh, in the previous session it was uh, this discussion was happening that the acquisition of uh, upper data is very important especially in uh, in camera so if something has been uh, has been not taken uh, accurately if the, if some of the feature is missing 
then getting that feature uh, back is very, very difficult. So uh, camera placement and acquisition plays the most important role and a lot of artificial intelligence nowadays are brought into the camera placement and, uh, and acquisition technique. When uh, in this, we will uh, talk about one of the implementation where we, uh, we will be placing a camera, optimal uh, placement of camera for gate pattern uh, recognition. There, I'll be telling you about uh, gate patterns, what is expected in gate pattern and how uh, cameras are placed in such a way that they, they are optimal for gate placement. This way, uh, nowadays, uh, placements are happening which are which are for a particular task. Like, as I said, this is for gate pattern recognition. One could be to maximize its uh, area of view. One of this could be to uh, to minimize the uh, blank spots. One of them could be for face recognition uh, of a person where the, uh, this criteria of gate and face will be completely opposite. So uh, the camera placement has uh, certain goals and uh, camera placement is done for that. Now, uh, this next, after uh, this demonstration, we will uh, move to uh, processing and inferences stage uh, of visual, uh, visual surveillance. If the camera is placed, we get the data and we try to process and infer from it. So uh, at that, uh, we will have uh, one uh, demonstration where we will be trying to estimate direction of walk of a pedestrian. And there we will, uh, we will implement so many uh, modification to what we will do previously. We will uh, apply hidden Markov model and over a temporal data, we will try to uh, estimate the direction of walk in a monocular vision. Why this is important? Because we are not using binocular vision, we are using monocular vision and still we are able to identify the direction of walk. I hope you can appreciate that the direction of walk is happening in a three-dimensional plane. So uh, for a single camera and to analyze uh, by a camera, of course, even when we are seeing a video which is captured from a single camera, our brain can, uh, can understand whether the subject is moving far or near. But for a camera, it is very difficult to understand that a subject is big and is far or it is small but closer because both of them will make an equal size uh, equal size uh, image over there okay and this will also uh, add up to another problem uh, which is called apparent speed problem apparent speed problem is that uh, the speed on the ground is different but what camera can perceive is different why because if the subject is close to the camera it will appear to it to be moving faster while if it is uh, away from the camera, then it will appear to be moving slower. If uh, my finger is close to this camera and this one is uh, far from it, and even if I move uh, for the same distance, the one which is closer will appear to you to be moving for a, for a, has covered more number of pixels, if I just, uh, say precisely, in terms of image. So this is called apparent uh, view. Uh, apparent view problem. It happens because of the uh, perspective distortion, distortion, which happens in single view camera. So we'll try to uh, talk about uh, this and uh, then we will incorporate uh, spatial features, that is per frame features, and uh, we'll have a spatio-temporal uh, method for uh, direction of walk estimation. And then of course we will, uh, we will try to uh, incorporate the uh, small errors, like if the direction, one of the direction is uh, predicted as one of the nearby directions, then we will call it as, uh, okay, yeah, this is also rank two accuracy, rank three accuracy, and it is not disastrous uh, classification. So that will also work for the future work that we are going to have. So this is uh, the whole package of direction of work estimation in uh, processing and inference. And then we will go for, uh, uh, predictive analysis. I was listening to one of the speak, speaker and uh, he was mentioning uh, very much about that how we need to shift from reactive to predictive and this is what we'll be uh, talking about here. So uh, rather than uh, reactive uh, method, occlusion uh, is what we'll be discussing here. Occlusion means uh, suppose uh, there is, there is a, a subject which is placed in camera's view and the one which is moving is uh, is going in such a direction that it is not visible after some time. So this is called this is called occlusions. Occlusion can be of uh, multiple types. It could be a static occlusion. Uh, static occlusion means uh, 
the occluder is uh, static while the uh, occludy is moving and it's going uh, beyond the view. Uh, dynamic occlusion, if both the subjects are moving, then this is called dynamic occlusion. One of the occlusion is called self-occlusion. Like uh, myself, if I hide uh, something and uh, my uh, some of some uh, part of the view is uh, goes missing, then this is called uh, self-occlusion. So we'll talk about occlusion prediction method. And uh, we'll also see that there are so many methods that was uh, that was reactive method. So what it was trying to do is that if the subject is uh, not visible, then it's, it's trying to estimate them where it would be uh, in that uh, invisible region. So it will try to have those type of estimation. The predictive analysis will try to predict the occlusion based on the behavior in a video. So if those subjects are coming together, then there is a chance of video. If those subjects are moving in the same direction, then there is no chance of uh, occlusion. So this is the predictive analysis that we will talk about and uh, then about the few efficient communications uh, and the scope of 5G network and uh, its implementation law. So uh, let us uh, start with task, task one, where we will talk about uh, optimized placement of camera for gate pattern recognition. What is uh, this uh, gate pattern recognition? So uh, gate is a unique way of muscular movement of lower half of the body. Uh, this is the image which tells about, uh, let's see, I have a Yeah, this this image uh, talks about this image talks about the gait. The way we we move our our leg is very much unique. Is very much unique. Now uh, this is a relatively different uh, research, but uh, it also demonstrate uh, gait very well. So what is happening over here? That this this phase. These, these, there are two phases. Like uh, one is the uh, double double support phase where both the their legs are supporting and the second one is the single support phase you can see over here this is the single uh, support phase so when the sing when the leg is in the single support phase one of the leg will demonstrate the complete swing so all these uh, leg uh, will will be planting somewhere then it will be moving ahead and then it will be uh, there will be a motion uh, there will be a stage of heel strike so these are these green zones are the one where both the legs are supporting. And these pink ones and blue ones, I don't know whether these colors are differently visible. These, uh, these are the one where one of the leg is swinging. So from one, Yeah, so uh, this stance phase to swing phase, if we see uh, there is one complete gate cycle which is happening and we need to capture this gate cycle for identification. This is classified as behavioral biometrics. Uh, the second point you can see over here, behavioral biometrics. So there are so many biometrics that we wear inside our body. Like, like the fingerprint, the iris, even lip is proven to be a bio, uh, is biometric, periocular region uh, surrounding of the eye region, uh, ear biometric, heart rate, so many things are something that we cannot change deliberately unless there is no accident or something. Of course, there is an effect of a season and uh, aging and all, but uh, mostly these are something which remains very much constant and this is called physiological biometric. On the other hand, there is something that we have in our behavior and that is also unique. These are called behavioral biometric, like, like our signature or the way we uh, type on a keyboard or the way we walk. These are called behavioral biometric. So gate biometric is one such biometric which says that the way we walk is quite unique 
And this is a, is a very hot topic of research nowadays, especially when you saw in the time of a pandemic when a, uh, half of the face is covered and people are afraid of touching uh, those uh, devices which are touched by others, then uh, gate biometric can be very much useful because we want ourselves to be identified at places. So there this uh, biometric becomes very important, like uh, in airports when, when uh, it is very much clear to us that this is the ramp from where we have to walk for before reaching for, uh, for our uh, personal checking, then at that time, I think if the camera can be placed, uh, gate biometric can work very well. But the need, uh, what is what is needed in uh, gate biometric is how well it can be captured. So a uh, fair few inferences which can which are made out of this is that uh, these are uh, three uh, different uh, angles of camera from where uh, if a person is moving, theta is zero means it is uh, right towards it. So if uh, the camera is placed like this and a person is made to walk like this, theta is zero. Uh, theta pi by 4 is an angular uh, direction and pi by 2 is exactly orthogonal. So what we can see that gate features are very much visible when the when the camera is kept orthogonal. When the camera is orthogonal, you can see this uh, uh, change when the legs are swinging in and swinging out the rectangular box we will try to uh, we have uh, for this experiment we have covered it with rectangular experiment and it was squeezing and uh, then it was uh, getting its uh, place with the uh, arm swing and all and it was very much uh, visible when the theta is pi by two so the inference that we made is that whenever we are trying to capture uh, capture uh, any view of a video from 90 degree angle then that is best placed for a gate camera so uh, if we have to place a camera we have to make sure that the uh, the camera is catching most of the person from a, from an open area in the orthogonal view so my task is very much uh, very much uh, uh, now identified i have to place camera in an open place and i have to see which is the place where most of the people are seen can be seen orthogonal for most of the time. So we came up with uh, this method uh, where what we are trying to do, we are trying to uh, track the locus of subjects movement. Then uh, we are trying to identify direction. And uh, with based on that, we will uh, cover everything in a path band and we'll try to estimate the path band. And then we will try to find out the efficient places where camera can be placed. It may be possible that all the places are not feasible uh, because of uh, some construction based uh, thing or maybe something else. And then we will, uh, then there could be some external regions, uh, reasons as well, like uh, uh, the light is coming from some another direction and that is uh, creating some issues. So we will get probable places where camera can be placed and based on that, we can go ahead with the camera. So uh, for getting it into a digital format we are uh, calculating we are trying to find out the traces of uh, and we are trying to find out these directions so this i'll tell you that uh, this if this is there is an open area we have placed an over the head camera to find out whether the people uh, from particular grid is moving uh, straight uh, pi by 8 pi so from 0 to pi you can see that we have identified eight different directions what we can have in the digital format and then we will try to have a locus of, uh, of walk pattern of different people from a from a different region based on that we will identify these individual tracks and we will find this type of case as you can see the c case which uh, grid with no locus as there could be many such places where people are not moving at all then there could be some chaos reason where uh, people are moving in all the directions. So we cannot conclude anywhere. So those uh, points of intersection are such points. But there are few uh, few uh, grids where we found a particular pattern that most of the people are moving in this direction. So these are the one where we are interested in. So with that, we will uh, we will give uh, we will find out a, a direction vector we will try to assign a direction vector to it as you can see in image a based on that we will have a, a path band and uh, we will have some quoted regions by uh, going with uh, uh, by seeing the uh, intersection of multiple multiple uh, uh, 
the perpendicular lines from these direction vectors we will get those uh, uh, those points and then we will have cameras placed on that so while uh, while trying to do that we placed one uh, over the head camera although uh, you can see that it is not uh, getting perfect because it is not exactly over the head but it is taking it from an angle but yes thankfully because of uh, the concept of homography we can uh, take it from this angle and then we can get the actual path so this was the long uh, data uh, that was created and uh, you can see on different instances uh, different people are moving in this direction in, like this and further uh, we took one of that and uh, then we tried uh, to have an optical flow of the same thing and then we tried to have a summarized video the same uh, summarization concept what we were discussing earlier so with that summarization we can have a track of the way the person is walking this is for uh, one uh, one such scenario and then we are trying to find out the histogram of orientation so uh, this is based on uh, this concept so what all uh, type of gray, uh, uh, grids we are getting so on the fruitful grids we are trying to identify that how many people went with zero uh, pi by eight pi by four so what is the dominant direction are we able to find any dominant direction so whatever we can find and uh, then we can uh, consider that as the direction where most of the people are walking in this way we can assign some uh, direction vector to it so this is the this is the image of a sample grid that we got and after homography on this uh, uh, made uh, this is the actual map of that where we have uh, got the grid uh, motion and then we ended up with that algorithm which can place us which can give us the probable places where you can see these uh, hills it says the uh, the best place where we can uh, we can have our cameras so you can see uh, three uh, hills which are created the third one is of course very small and the first two are the most prominent ones so it gives us a clear indication that if we want a camera to be placed for uh, for gait pattern recognition then we need to capture orthogonal view and these are the places where most of the orthogonal views are are catchable if on the other hand we change our criteria by not capturing gait pattern rather face based recognition this exact placement will will be inverted because these are the worst places because if we do some survey for that we will find out that if the pi uh, if the uh, theta is zero that is if it is if the subject is moving straight towards the camera then the place uh, then the face is best viewed because most of the features are uh, uh, visible in the frontal view not on the profile view so uh, this is uh, this is the one and uh, i just forgot to mention that not only not only uh, gate based biometric uh, we have other soft biometric like height right of course it cannot be used for uh, for identification but when we are performing this type of classification it can be used for rejection so there of course this height based uh, method can be useful so uh, with this, we will come to a uh, second uh, part, which is about direction of walk estimation of a pedestrian. So I think we have already uh, talked about uh, pedestrian. Pedestrian is someone, is a human, which has a tendency of locomotion. So there are so many tasks which has to be done on, which are done uh, on pedestrian surveillance, which includes pedestrian uh, detection, uh, pedestrian identification and re-identification that we have already talked about. Then uh, event analysis of uh, pedestrian, which uh, includes suspicious uh, activities, uh, fall uh, and accident for uh, child and elder, elderly, and the occlusion that we are going to discuss later. Then uh, we have this uh, pedestrian uh, motion analysis. Pedestrian uh, motion analysis can be uh, said as uh, pedestrian motion analysis. Uh, when we take over a single camera, it is uh, it is like uh, uh, we can talk about someone's orientation because if we talk on a single frame, not single camera, if we talk on a single frame, then uh, one can be captured with face on a particular direction. So we can talk about someone's orientation, but whether that orientation will result into a direction of motion, that is a different uh, aspect altogether. So uh, on pedestrian motion analysis, we uh, we usually look at where the pedestrian is 
heading or whether uh, whether he is trying to head towards now uh, there are two things one is that whether we want to see this on a temporal data if we want to see it on a temporal data the advantage is we will get clear uh, clear picture of its motion and then the analysis will become far more easier because we have uh, we have proved uh, we have a sufficient proof of motion in a particular direction whereas if we check but the problem is that we need uh, some number of frames to analyze right and that analysis on the temporal domain is also uh, having a lot of data so that is again an issue so second is uh, that we are talking about pedestrians orientation now when we talk about orientation it means we are talking about one single frame what we are observing in a single frame so uh, what we are observing in a single frame may be orientation but that orientation may not result into direction of motion like if uh, my face is oriented in this that does not mean that i am walking in this direction i might be walking in this direction so we need to find out the uh, exact orientation feature of the body when we are talking about uh, uh, spatial features that we will uh, talk on the uh, second part of the second uh, second uh, task and uh, then uh, but the advantage of uh, this motion analysis is that once we do this motion analysis it helps in uh, pedestrian detection as i said that it can differentiate from a human and uh, then uh, pedestrian identification and re-identification how it uh, dif uh, differentiate from pedestrian detection that there are so many methods which uh, identifies a pedestrian okay but what if uh, an epg is placed or uh, someone is taking some uh, some heroes cut out and is moving like this so that will also appear to be moving but if we rely on the rectangular box and we see the the uh, walking pattern the way we are seeing in gait pattern and that we classify as pedestrian so these these errors like a um, uh, moving of a cutout and uh, moving of uh, some idol or something which will not have locomotion feature first locomotion feature of centroid and the second thing is the walking pattern the change of width and change of height if these features are not observed one can say that it is something that looks like human but it is not a human so this is this is the advantage of uh, uh, pedestrian motion analysis which it will reflect in pedestrian detection and of course in uh, uh, gate and all these methods will help in identification and re-identification and of course uh, these motion features will help in pedestrian event analysis so this is the impact of uh, pedestrian uh, uh, motion uh, analysis and understanding pedestrians motion so uh, now we have already talked about spatial and temporal domain and why we are uh, going for walk direction distribution so the concept of orientation within one frame and direction of walk is also uh, we have uh, talked about now uh, we will uh, classify this work into four uh, four uh, different domains i'll speed up a little bit because uh, study on surveillance databases what are the uh, exact type of uh, features we are looking for in a database that is very important and then a study of a temporal walk pattern that we will do and then we will integrate spatial temporal patterns spatial and temporal pattern we will uh, integrate in the second part and then we will include this fuzzy approach of walk direction estimation as well so uh, coming on to the aspects of evaluation on a database we want our database to have uh, more uh, to, to be very versatile so that uh, if someone is carrying a bag, someone is wearing a coat, or someone is wearing uh, wearing any any sari or something, where uh, most of the features are not visible, so it should include all such cases. Second thing which is desired is that uh, if there is some occlusion, so we will include that cases also. We will include those cases where uh, where uh, all the uh, direction of walk the uh, walk along all the directions are visible. So that is again pre uh, preferred. So these are these are some of the aspects which uh, we want uh, to be present in our database. If they are present, we say that our database is uh, quite uh, uh, versatile. It is having a constraint, and if it is uh, having cases where people are moving in all the direction, then we can get uh, all the type of cases to classify, and this is very much uh, desirable. So. Uh, 
what we are going to do is we are going to uh, classify eight discrete directions eight discrete directions with respect to the camera as the people is a uh, person pedestrian is moving from uh, from one point to another point if it is moving directly towards the directly away from the camera it is direction one if it is moving directly towards the camera it is direction five and we have direction two three and four equiangular and similarly on the other side we have direction six seven and eight so uh, with that we have selected this uh, casea a which is meant for gate and uh, casea b which is again meant for uh, gate this uh, chinese academy of sciences is making so many databases i think you can visit if you need uh, those databases and there was uh, one database uh, i uh, uh, which is uh, hosted in uh, nit uh, raurkela nowadays uh, it is on Con uh, conscious walk database where people are made to walk in uh, those uh, directions those specific uh, directions uh, this, is, this is the sample of that database where we are having one uh, slightly cluttered uh, background and we have variation in the lighting as well so these this will uh, help us in uh, getting good pre-processing test whether our pre-processing methods are good or not so uh, this is the detail of the database if we see the fourth row over here the walk directions which are available are 6 11 and 8 but if you see in the kcr database b these 11 direction does not cover that 0 to 360 degree so it will okay. be walking. yes all right so it might not be uh, walking in all these uh, 11 directions so this is uh, another another thing uh, so here we may get some less accuracy this is uh, what i wanted to tell you so but yes uh, they have those special cases present like uh, partial static occlusion is present then uh, they have different head and body orientation, which was present in the uh, NITR data. And uh, then we have uh, varying directions, varying walk velocity, and then uh, carrying and clothing condition is one important point, which is uh, available only in the KCR database, B and not in other two databases. So this is the reason why we are including uh, both of them. And uh, the proposed work will go with the pre-processing and uh, it's like image processing to get clear images then feature formulation using hidden markov model that we will discuss and problem modeling through hidden markov model and then how we will go ahead with the machine learning see this is the image which indicates which is in parallel to the eight direction we have talked about so in the middle if you see uh, on go on to the top it is camera is exactly opposite uh, moving towards the opposite from the camera and the one which is uh, getting bigger is when we move towards the camera why we are working on rectangular box and why we are not finding the entire edge of the body when that is also possible through image processing that's because that's because it will give us more information putting rectangular box on a temporal data is much more easier and this way we are uh, reducing our entire uh, entire data to two variables per frame which is width and height of the bounding box that's it so with less uh, less uh, value in the feature the processing will become much more faster so what we uh, we can observe here is the pattern of change in width as we move along four of the direction because of uh, the clumsy it will become uh, quite quite uh, uh, yeah clumsy that is why we are not showing all the eight discrete directions but pattern is definitely which is visible if somebody is moving in direction five which is shown in the green line over here which is shown in the green line over here the uh, the width is increasing the width is increasing if we are uh, moving towards the camera if we are in direction direction four direction four is one two three four direction four it has a mix of both the, both the nature so it is increasing in the side it is increasing in the side right starting uh, starting width and ending width are different whereas if you see uh, direction seven and uh, direction five this is direction six if you see direction six in the black the starting direction and uh, this 
direction seven, the starting and closing are exactly same. Starting and closing are exactly same. And if you see this direction four and direction six, direction one, two, three, four, and direction six, they have similar nature. Ending point is almost same. Starting point is almost same. So there is slight increase. As the subject came closer, the uh, width became uh, more, more and more bigger. So there is definitely some feature which is associated with the change in the pattern of width. Similar is the change and it is even more visible when we are talking about height. So maybe this uh, cyclic nature is not visible, but uh, the, the pattern is definitely seems to be changing a lot. If you see, I feel would have taken other four uh, directions like uh, if it is moving like this in five, it will be showing this type of uh, uh, nature when we take direction one. So that is why we are uh, talking about these four because other ones are going to be the mirror image of the same. So what is the what is the uh, uh, outcome of this uh, study is that the uh, expression what you can see uh, probability of q t plus one given q t and y t is equal to probability of Q T one T plus one given Q T. Q T plus one is the current location where the subject is uh, standing right now, and Q T is where it was standing previously, and Y T is how it has reached to that path. So uh, the point is that uh, Q T one is only a function of Q T. So it is only a function of from where it has reached. So it is not a function of how it has reached, which is a Markovian chain function and this says that it uh, is very uh, good for uh, for applying uh, markovian chain property and hence hidden markov model based uh, machine learning can be done very well on that so uh, we will uh, identify set of uh, observed states we will uh, the observed state sequence is uh, generated from 30 frames and uh, the pattern of width uh, change and the pattern of height change and the centroid displacement. Centroid displacement because uh, both the uh, width pattern change as we saw in direction four and six were same, but the centroid is different. So uh, I think this uh, diagram shows that one, two, eight, three, seven, four, six, and five. So these will uh, show same type of uh, features, but between two and eight, two and eight, three and uh, three and seven, and four and six what will differentiate is this uh, centroid displacement. So this way we can uh, identify differences only by using a rectangular box and not going with edges and not going with any other property. And of course, about the hidden state, it is quite difficult to say what are the hidden states. And uh, I think this is, the, this is the discussion that we were having in neural network as well. So we have observed state, we introduce one hidden state and uh, then from that hidden state, we go to some visible state. Sometimes we may have more number of hidden states. So how we decide the number of hidden states over there? The natural concept is that uh, you, know, you take one hidden state and uh, see how good the classification is. If there is anything missing, you go with adding another uh, hidden state and it will work for most of the cases. How many, how many uh, uh, neurons has to be there in that. We just uh, try to take average of uh, whatever is in the input and output layer and we uh, go with that. So this is what happening over here. Over here, how we are trying to take hidden, uh, hidden uh, states. So if we see the uh, nature and try to analyze that what would have been the feature when the subject is moving, uh, moving towards, uh, moving and showing some uh, gate, uh, feature. So it will be shrinking in the size and then it will uh, go back to its normal size and then it will uh, with the hand swings and all it will go back once again, which is sinusoidal. So there we are identifying these four uh, layers and based on that we will go with the four hidden uh, Markov model. But I have other justifications for going this is uh, by doing experiments of the three hidden and five hidden layers, uh, four comes out to be best. If uh, you see most of the experiments are done with this uh, three, four, and five hidden layers. So this is uh, the uh, uh, the hidden layer uh, diagram. What you can see, uh, we have uh, hidden states W1 to W3.
we have uh, visible states v1 to uh, v level uh, vn as you can see in all of this so uh, emission probability will vary from uh, from uh, v1 to vn and this shows that what could have been the actual hidden state so this is how we estimate the hidden state in hidden markov model what what we see is visible state and their emission probability which is b11 b12 like this and this is the transition state a12 to a21 so when it is changing inside from one hidden to another hidden state it will have uh, property of uh, uh, like the visible state probability for one of them will become very high indicating that this is the underlying hidden state so uh, with this, uh, we uh, went for a formulation of uh, our problem. And uh, of course, we trained it. And then we tried to test it. And of course, with separate videos. And uh, our transition is doing very uh, log, -li log likelihood uh, diagrams, and uh, which is uh, converging at some point which, uh, at, uh, and becoming very constant to show that it is, uh, it is learning very well. And this is what we have done with uh, different uh, databases, and we have tried doing that. So I'll just skip that section as well. And we created the experimental uh, environment, uh, which I will summarize at the end. We have got uh, classification accuracy. Of course, it is multi-class classification, and we have not got all the varieties of directions, but still uh, we have D1, D2, uh, D2. Accuracy has uh, decreased over here. That is because the direction of walk is not constant in this particular database. Because in between the walk also, the direction was changing. And this is where you can see the limitation of uh, temporal uh, analysis as well. Because we, we are talking about uh, one second's data, two seconds data. So if, what if the direction changes in between? So the results will change. And hence, this confusion matrix is so showing lots of error still we are uh, able to get more than 90 percent of accuracy so uh, this uh, is the summary of all the results that we have got over here now uh, we are trying to modify it it's already okay i'm having 20 minutes integrated spatio uh, temporal pattern for pedestrian walk direction estimation what we are trying to do over here is we are taking spatial uh, properties as well. And when we are talking about spatial uh, properties, what we are including, we are trying to, uh, to do the, uh, the uh, kinesiology based study where we are trying to estimate the kinematics uh, study of human body motion. So when we move, when we move, we move along the sagittal plane. So when we move, we move along the sagittal plane. And hence, the, uh, all these features which are re uh, related to flexion, extension, and uh, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, which is uh, planting and uh, taking away our feet, these are the one which we should matter, which should matter to us when we are seeing within the frame. See, what we are trying to do, we are trying to uh, incorporate orientation information, and this orientation should talk about the direction of walk. If I will include my head position or head tilt to indicate that this is my direction of walk, this might not be true. But if I take the uh, the feature which is uh, which is uh, uh, it in our uh, kind of this uh, sagittal plane, then it is it has been shown only when we tend to walk. So even if uh, uh, we take uh, one frame of a certain uh, certain pe uh, pedestrian when it is someone is on the move, and if the features are associated from the sagittal plane, it is definitely talking about the motion. So this is the this is the prime idea, and we took hip and uh, pelvic motion, knee motion, and ankle motion, and uh, this is how our study is inspired. So we try to identify the pelvic region. We try to identify knee region. And uh, above uh, feet, we uh, tried to uh, find out ankle region. We, of course, uh, we have taken multiple layers, uh, golden uh, ratio. We used a uh, golden ratio to identify these parts. So uh, we formulated this uh, with the least square support vector machine because uh, we wanted uh, test calculation. We went with a faster uh, SVM. Uh, 
method and then we try to incorporate the previous method and uh, the proposed method we are calling it as topology one and two in both the cases when uh, we are getting some equivalent uh, decision and when we are both the algorithms are giving some contradictory uh, decision so then we perform we actually incorporated both of them and with then we had this experiment that is we had this uh, experiment two uh, done and then we try to uh, get the result of uh, these experiments so what we can see is that the uh, the topology one which was only video based was giving this much accuracy but after incorporating topology two it's uh, the accuracy is getting somehow improved it is getting somehow improved so this is very much because of the because of the uh, per frame uh, uh, recommendation which was happening so we uh, used uh, rbf uh, kernel and that too we uh, we are showing here that uh, experimentally it is uh, showing better re uh, result than linear and polynomial ones and uh, the topology uh, three result is uh, always improved now uh, one thing that uh, we will take up next is uh, occlusion handling and uh, before that i'll talk about this fuzzy approach but in occlusion handling we are exploiting the fact of uh, of dynamic occlusion i have already told you about dynamic occlusion when two of the subjects are approaching towards each other it is called dynamic foot because both of them are in motion so when both of them are in motion then whether the subject is moving exactly towards each other or i would say that this subject is moving like this but this subject is moving like this so if both are approaching each other then occlusion is bound to happen so my point is that if my classification of direction of walk is not accurate if it is not getting uh, calculated like this but is getting calculated like this then also that uh, that will add up when we when we talk about occlusion handling in future so this will add up had it been that there is a uh, there is a motion like this and it is categorized like this then it will not add up so uh, what i am trying to say is that if i'll fuzzify the result and not neglect the result which is a slight uh, miscalculation then we will uh, we will get some information which could be which is again helpful and this is why we are trying to go beyond uh, discrete directions and this time we will talk about north south and all these uh, discrete uh, directions in particular direction because we want to end up in uh, in a fuzzy uh, result where we will talk about the degree of uh, motion degree of walk pattern so uh, we'll uh, talk about this uh, member uh, membership uh, membership function we will try to identify these uh, eight membership function and we will have our angular aggregated uh, direction of walk in degrees like this and the membership will vary from 0 to 1 and as we are moving to all these eight directions so uh, what we are doing over here is we are trying to have a gen uh, generation of oriented histogram orientation histogram is what we are uh, collecting now with that orientation histogram if we are getting north and west and all these uh, directions then we will uh, not consider them okay we will not consider them and rather we will uh, refer the previous temporal feature time domain feature and what classification it has done if it has uh, classified it and we will incorporate this result then based on that we can neglect this and we can say that okay there are few frames which uh, our uh, method uh, which our uh, uh, spatial method has not classified accurately which is not the overall result of our temporal uh, direction so we will neglect that now maybe the direction was south east but there are so many frames which are also indicating east direction it means the direction which was actually classified earlier was south east but there are so many uh, frames potential frames which are also indicating that it was moving in east direction so maybe the direction was somewhere between southeast and east and that is why this uh, membership function will help us because this time we will not only talk about the direction which is the accurate direction rather we will also in, uh, calculate the direction on 
the first neighborhood and this way we will get rank one and rank two accuracies rank two accuracy means if the direction three is classified as two or four they are also considered in the accuracy because as i said in further implementation that can, that could be useful so what we see that there is sudden uh, increment in the accuracy right we are talking discreetly that is why uh, this is getting uh, so good and uh, in fact in one of them it has reached till 100 percent as well but how uh, with uh, this uh, fuzzifying this uh, whole experiment how we can get the uh, actual output is like this that uh, we can have weight of north and northeast if uh, you can remember uh, from that uh, image and we can get it as a degree degree so uh, in these cases if we go with the first and second and third methods uh, we will get direction six direction six and direction six but here we will also talk about the degree here so these are some of the results talking on to the third part which is uh, the occlusion handling which is happening in the next level where we are trying to to uh, predict something uh, i'll skip this uh, surveys and I'll go with the summary of uh, this survey that we have a single camera based occlusion and a multi camera based occlusion. So when we talk about single camera based occlusion, it is actually an occlusion because uh, the subject is actually hidden. So our job is to predict in multi camera based occlusion. It avoids occlusion and best uh, uh, it will somehow uh, avoid occlusion because if the occlusion is happening from this camera, maybe this camera is getting the perfect view. So occlusion might be uh, might be avoided, but the target will be about best view synthesis. So that same uh, mechanism in multi-camera uh, based occlusion will help us in uh, generating that which of the camera is getting best view. So it, the same task will change to best view synthesis over there. And uh, we will uh, we are trying to develop this, and I'll show you how we are ended up with the results. All right, so uh, these are the steps involved. I think I have uh, already uh, talked about and explain it here. So uh, what we are actually doing is that uh, there are two subjects which are moving towards each other. So we will uh, run this uh, uh, method of uh, direction of walk estimation of uh, pedestrian one and then of uh, pedestrian two. And if it is uh, uh, three and seven, if it is three and seven, then both are moving towards each other. And this is there is definitely going to be an occlusion. Then there will be something called apparent speed, which is important. So uh, earlier I talked to you about uh, apparent speed. And because in a single camera view, we don't have depth information. So we don't know that uh, whether there will be an actual uh, uh, what is the actual speed on the ground. But what we see is that how it appears to be moving in single camera. And that is what matters in case of occlusion, not the actual speed, rather the apparent speed. So if two subjects are moving like this, then we know that their apparent speed with respect to that camera. And I can say that, okay, after these many frames, they might occlude each other without knowing which is the occluder and which is the occluding. If this subject is closer to the camera and this is far from the camera, this will be having the one which is closer to the camera will be having higher apparent speed for the camera. So our uh, target will change this time because we have higher apparent speed. Then we know that the uh, occlusion will happen, but few frames earlier. So based on apparent speed and uh, based on the direction of walk, what we estimate we can have a rule based method which can uh, which can identify whether there will be occlusion or non occlusion so uh, this way we can say whether uh, what are the chances that there could be an occlusion and we, we can predict uh, occlusion this is one of the case like if the subject is moving in direction 1 another one is moving in direction 5 and there won't be any occlusion and uh, we won't keep track of it why we are actually bothering about occlusion because whenever our tracking mechanism is working so if there is an occlusion and there is only one one rectangular box which was tracking it 
So after this point, it will get confused that whether the same subject after occlusion has returned to the previous step or there is something else. So because of that, we need to predict occlusion. Also, when we don't want uh, any frame to be to be missing, any any uh, uh, one particular frame of the track which does not have that information for best view synthesis, of course. So uh, these are some of the examples where uh, we can identify that there will definitely be occlusion. And uh, of course, uh, having discussed all of this, this is some of the uh, it is uh, one of the futuristic image where we can have a, a visual surveillance with uh, all these uh, uh, information going to the cloud platform, and we are having uh, so many information coming to. Uh, different information. These are uh, some of the uh, another uh, websites and a list of uh, sites and information that I will share to you. I'll also advise you to read IEEE Spectrum this uh, for today, this month, where they have talked about what should be the rule and uh, what should be the limitation of AI. So, uh, thank you, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Uh, any questions from the audience? Please feel free to ask the speaker. Okay, I think uh, fine. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Raghunam, for your wonderful, you know, speech and with the good illustrations. So, I I am sure that the participants, uh, you know, would have uh, benefited a lot, and uh, many more people because we are going to put in YouTube. Many people, people going to watch and get benefit. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Salvarad sir. Thank you everyone for uh, listening to me and uh, thank you sir.